Chapter four and five of Looking Backward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Looking Backward, two thousand to eighteen eighty seven, by Edward Bellamy. Chapter four. I did not faint, but the effort to realize my position made me very giddy, and I remember that my companion had to give me a strong arm as he conducted me from the roof to a roomy apartment on the upper floor of the house, where he insisted on my drinking a glass or two of good wine and partaking of a light repast. "'I think you are going to be all right now,' he said cheerily. "'I should not have taken so abrupt a means to convince you of your position if your course, while perfectly excusable under the circumstances, had not rather obliged me to do so. I confess,' he added laughing, "'I was a little apprehensive at one time that I should undergo what I believe you used to call a knockdown in the nineteenth century, if I did not act rather promptly.' I remembered that the Bostonians of your day were famous pugilists, and thought best to lose no time. I take it you are now ready to acquit me of the charge of hoaxing you. "'If you had told me,' I replied, profoundly awed, "'that a thousand years instead of a hundred had elapsed since I last looked on this city, I should now believe you.' "'Only a century has passed,' he answered. "'But many a millennium in the world's history has seen changes less extraordinary.' And now, he added, extending his hand with an air of irresistible cordiality, let me give you a hearty welcome to the Boston of the twentieth century and to this house. My name is Leet, Dr. Leet, they call me. My name, I said as I shook his hand, is Julian West. I am most happy in making your acquaintance, Mr. West, he responded. Seeing that this house is built on the side of your own, I hope you'll find it easy to make yourself at home in it. After my refreshment, Dr. Leed offered me a bath and a change of clothing, of which I gladly availed myself. It did not appear that any very startling revolution in men's attire had been among the great changes my host had spoken of, for, barring a few details, my new habiliments did not puzzle me at all. Physically, I was now myself again. But mentally, how was it with me, the reader will doubtless wonder. What were my intellectual sensations, he may wish to know, on finding myself so suddenly dropped, as it were, into a new world? In reply, let me ask him to suppose himself suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, transported from earth, say, to paradise or Hades. What does he fancy would be his own experience? Would his thoughts return at once to the earth he had just left, or would he, after the first shock, well nigh forget his former life for a while, albeit to be remembered later? in the interest excited by his new surroundings. All I can say is that if his experience were at all like mine in the transition I am describing, the latter hypothesis would prove the correct one. The impressions of amazement and curiosity which my new surroundings produced occupied my mind, after the first shock, to the exclusion of all other thoughts. For the time, the memory of my former life was, as it were, in abeyance. No sooner did I find myself physically rehabilitated through the kind offices of my host than I became eager to return to the housetop, and presently we were comfortably established there in easy chairs, with the city beneath and around us. After Dr. Leed had responded to numerous questions on my part as to the ancient landmarks I missed and the new ones which had replaced them, he asked me what point of the contrast between the new and the old city struck me most forcibly. To speak of small things before great, I responded, I really think that the complete absence of chimneys and their smoke is a detail that first impressed me. Ah, ejaculated my companion with an air of much interest, I had forgotten the chimneys. It is so long since they went out of use. It is nearly a century since the crude method of combustion on which you depended for heat became obsolete. In general, I said, what impresses me most about the city is the material prosperity on the part of the people which its magnificence implies. I would give a great deal for just one glimpse of the Boston of your day, replied Dr. Leet. No doubt, as you imply, the cities of that period were rather shabby affairs. If you had the taste to make them splendid, which I would not be so rude as to question, the general poverty resulting from your extraordinary industrial system would not have given you the means. Moreover, the excessive individualism which then prevailed was inconsistent with much public spirit. What little wealth you had seems almost wholly to have been lavished in private luxury. Nowadays, on the contrary, there is no destination of the surplus wealth so popular as the adornment of the city, which all enjoy in equal degree. 
The sun had been setting as we returned to the housetop, and as we talked, night descended upon the city. "'It is growing dark,' said Dr. Leete. "'Let us descend into the house. I want to introduce my wife and daughter to you.' His words recalled to me the feminine voices which I had heard whispering about me as I was coming back to conscious life, and, most curious to learn what the ladies of the year 2000 were like, I assented with alacrity to the proposition. The apartment in which we found the wife and daughter of my host, as well as the entire interior of the house, was filled with a mellow light, which I knew must be artificial, although I could not discover the source from which it was diffused. Mrs. Leete was an exceptionally fine-looking and well-preserved woman of about her husband's age, while the daughter, who was in the first blush of womanhood, was the most beautiful girl I had ever seen. Her face was as bewitching as deep blue eyes, delicately tinted complexion, and perfect features could make it, but even had her countenance lacked special charms, the faultless luxuriance of her figure would have given her place as a beauty among the women of the nineteenth century. Feminine softness and delicacy were in this lovely creature deliciously combined with an appearance of health and abounding physical vitality too often lacking in the maidens with whom alone I could compare her. It was a coincidence, trifling in comparison with the general strangeness of the situation, but still striking, that her name should be Edith. The evening that followed was certainly unique in the history of social intercourse, but to suppose that our conversation was peculiarly strained or difficult would be a great mistake. I believe, indeed, that it is under what may be called unnatural, in the sense of extraordinary, circumstances, that people behave most naturally for the reason, no doubt, that such circumstances banish artificiality. I know, at any rate, that my intercourse that evening with these representatives of another age and world was marked by an ingenious sincerity and frankness, such as but rarely crown long acquaintance. No doubt the exquisite tact of my entertainers had much to do with this. Of course, there was nothing we could talk of but the strange experience by virtue of which I was there but they talked of it with an interest so naive and direct in its expression as to relieve the subject, to a great degree, of the element of the weird and the uncanny which might so easily have been overpowering. One would have supposed that they were quite in the habit of entertaining waves from another century, so perfect was their tact. For my own part, never do I remember the operations of my mind to have been more alert and acute than that evening, or my intellectual sensibilities more keen of course, I do not mean that the consciousness of my amazing situation was for a moment out of mind, but its chief effect thus far was to produce a feverish elation, a sort of mental intoxication. Footnote. In accounting for this state of mind, it must be remembered that, except for the topic of our conversations, there was in my surroundings next to nothing to suggest what had befallen me. Within a block of my home in the old Boston, I could have found social circles vastly more foreign to me. The speech of the Bostonians of the twentieth century differs even less from that of their cultured ancestors of the nineteenth than did that of the latter from the language of Washington and Franklin, while the differences between the style of dress and furniture of the two epochs are not more marked than I have known fashion to make in the time of one generation. End footnote. Edith Leed took little part in the conversation, but when several times the magnetism of her beauty drew my glance to her face, I found her eyes fixed on me with an absorbed intensity, almost like fascination. It was evident that I had excited her interest to an extraordinary degree, as was not astonishing, supposing her to be a girl of imagination. Though I supposed curiosity was the chief motive of her interest, it could but affect me, as it would not have done had she been less beautiful." Dr. Leete, as well as the ladies, seemed greatly interested in my account of the circumstances under which I had gone to sleep in the underground chamber. All had suggestions to offer to account for my having been forgotten there, and a theory which we finally agreed on offers at least a plausible explanation, although whether it be in its details the true one nobody, of course, will ever know. The layer of ashes found above the chamber indicated that the house had been burned down. Let it be supposed that the conflagration had taken place the night I fell asleep. It only remains to assume that Sawyer lost his life in the fire or by some accident connected with it, and the rest follows naturally enough. No one but he and Dr. Pillsbury either knew of the existence of the chamber or that I was in it, and Dr. Pillsbury, who had gone that night to New Orleans, had probably never heard of the fire at all. The conclusion of my friends and of the public must have been that I had perished in the flames.' 
an excavation of the ruins, unless thorough, would not have disclosed the recess in the foundation walls connecting with my chamber. To be sure, if the site had been again built upon, at least immediately, such an excavation would have been necessary, but the troublous times and the undesirable character of the locality might well have prevented rebuilding. The size of the trees in the garden now occupying the site indicated, Dr. Leeds said, that for more than half a century at least it had been open ground. Chapter 5 When, in the course of the evening, the ladies retired, leaving Dr. Leeds and myself alone, he sounded me as to my disposition for sleep, saying that if I felt like it my bed was ready for me, but if I was inclined to wakefulness nothing would please him better than to bear me company. I am a late bird myself, he said, and, without suspicion of flattery, I may say that a companion more interesting than yourself could scarcely be imagined. It is decidedly not often that one has a chance to converse with a man of the nineteenth century. Now, I had been looking forward all the evening with some dread to the time when I should be alone on retiring for the night. Surrounded by these most friendly strangers, stimulated and supported by their sympathetic interest, I had been able to keep my mental balance. Even then, however, in pauses of the conversation, I had had glimpses, vivid as lightning flashes, of the horror of strangeness that was waiting to be faced when I could no longer command diversion. I knew I could not sleep that night, and as for lying awake and thinking, it argues no cowardice, I am sure, to confess that I was afraid of it. When, in reply to my host's question, I frankly told him this, he replied that it would be strange if I did not feel just so, but that I need have no anxiety about sleeping. Whenever I wanted to go to bed, he would give me a dose which would ensure me a sound night's sleep without fail. Next morning, no doubt, I would awake with the feeling of an old citizen. Before I acquired that, I replied, I must know a little more about the sort of Boston I have come back to. You told me when we were upon the housetop that though a century only had elapsed since I fell asleep, it had been marked by greater changes in the conditions of humanity than many a previous millennium. With the city before me I could well believe that, but I am very curious to know what some of the changes have been. To make a beginning somewhere, for the subject is doubtless a large one, what solution, if any, have you found for the labour question? It was the Sphinx's riddle of the nineteenth century, and when I dropped out, the Sphinx was threatening to devour society, because the answer was not forthcoming. It is well worth sleeping a hundred years to learn what the right answer was, if, indeed, you have found it yet. As no such thing as the labour question is known nowadays, replied Dr. Leet, and there is no way in which it could arise, I suppose we may claim to have solved it. Society would indeed have fully deserved being devoured if it had failed to answer a riddle so entirely simple. In fact, to speak by the book, it was not necessary for society to solve the riddle at all. It may be said to have solved itself. The solution came as the result of a process of industrial evolution which could not have terminated otherwise. All that society had to do was to recognize and cooperate with that evolution, when its tendency had become unmistakable. I can only say, I answered, that at the time I fell asleep no such evolution had been recognized. It was in 1887 that you fell into this sleep, I think you said. Yes, May 30th, 1887. My companion regarded me musingly for some moments. Then he observed, And you tell me that even then there was no general recognition of the nature of the crisis which society was nearing. Of course, I fully credit your statement. The singular blindness of your contemporaries to the signs of the times is a phenomenon commented on by many of our historians, but few facts of history are more difficult for us to realize, so obvious and unmistakable as we look back seem the indications which must also have come under your eyes, of the transformation about to come to pass. I should be interested, Mr. West, if you would give me a little more definite idea of the view which you, and men of your grade of intellect, took of the state and prospects of society in 1887. You must at least have realized that the widespread industrial and social troubles, and the underlying dissatisfaction of all classes with the inequalities of society, and the general misery of mankind, were portents of great changes of some sort. We did indeed fully realize that, I replied. We felt that society was dragging anchor and in danger of going adrift. 
Whether it would drift, nobody could say, but all feared the rocks. Nevertheless, said Dr. Leete, the set of the current was perfectly perceptible if you had but taken pains to observe it, and it was not towards the rocks, but toward a deeper channel. We had a popular proverb, I replied, that hindsight is better than foresight, the force of which I shall now, no doubt, appreciate more fully than ever. All I can say is that the prospect was such when I went into that long sleep, that I should not have been surprised had I looked down from your house-top to-day on a heap of charred and moss-grown ruins instead of this glorious city. Dr. Leed had listened to me with close attention and nodded thoughtfully as I finished speaking. "'What you have said,' he observed, "'will be regarded as a most valuable vindication of Storio, whose account of your era has been generally thought exaggerated in its picture of the gloom and confusion of men's minds, that a period of transition like that should be full of excitement and agitation was indeed to be looked for, but seeing how plain was the tendency of the forces in operation, it was natural to believe that hope rather than fear would have been the prevailing temper of the popular mind. "'You have not yet told me what was the answer to the riddle which you found,' I said. I am impatient to know by what contradiction of natural sequence the peace and prosperity which you now seem to enjoy could have been the outcome of an era like my own. "'Excuse me,' replied my host, "'but do you smoke?' It was not till our cigars were lighted and drawing well that he resumed. "'Since you are in the humour to talk rather than to sleep, as I certainly am, perhaps I cannot do better than to try to give you enough idea of our modern industrial system to dissipate, at least, the impression that there is any mystery about the process of its evolution. The Bostonians of your day had the reputation of being great askers of questions, and I am going to show my dissent by asking you one to begin with. What should you name as the most prominent feature of the labour troubles of your day? Why, the strikes, of course, I replied. Exactly. But what made the strikes so formidable? The great labour organisations. And what was the motive of these great organisations? The workmen claimed they had to organise to get their rights from the big corporations, I replied. That is just it, said Dr. Leet. The organisation of labour and the strikes were an effect, merely, of the concentration of capital in greater masses than had ever been known before. Before this concentration began, while as yet commerce and industry were conducted by innumerable petty concerns with small capital, instead of a small number of great concerns with vast capital, the individual workman was relatively important and independent in his relations to the employer. Moreover, when a little capital or a new idea was enough to start a man in business for himself, working men were constantly becoming employers, and there was no hard and fast line between the two classes. Labor unions were needless then, and general strikes out of the question. But when the era of small concerns with small capital was succeeded by that of the great aggregations of capital, all this was changed. The individual laborer, who had been relatively important to the small employer, was reduced to insignificance and powerlessness over against the great corporation, while at the same time the way upward to the great employer was close to him. Self-defense drove him to union with his fellows. The records of the period show that the outcry against the concentration of capital was furious. Men believed that it threatened society with a form of tyranny more abhorrent than it ever endured. They believed that the great corporations were preparing for them the yoke of a baser servitude than had ever been imposed on the race, servitude not to men but to soulless machines incapable of any motive but insatiable greed. Looking back, we cannot wonder at their desperation, for certainly humanity was never confronted with a fate more sordid and hideous than would have been the era of corporate tyranny which they anticipated. Meanwhile, without being in the smallest degree checked by the clamour against it, the absorption of business by ever larger monopolies continued. In the United States there was not, after the beginning of the last quarter of the century, any opportunity whatever for individual enterprise in any important field of industry, unless backed by a great capital. During the last decade of the century, such small businesses as still remained were fast-failing survivals of a past epoch, or mere parasites on the great corporations, 
or else existed in fields too small to attract the great capitalists. Small businesses, as far as they still remained, were reduced to the condition of rats and mice, living in holes and corners, and counting on evading notice for the enjoyment of existence. The railroads had gone on combining till a few great syndicates controlled every rail in the land. In manufactories, every important staple was controlled by a syndicate. These syndicates, pools, trusts, or whatever their name, fixed prices and crushed all competition except when combinations as vast as themselves arose. Then a struggle, resulting in a still greater consolidation, ensued. The great city bazaar crushed its country rivals with branch stores, and in the city itself absorbed its smaller rivals till the business of a whole quarter was concentrated under one roof, with a hundred former proprietors of shops serving as clerks. Having no business of his own to put his money in, the small capitalist, at the same time that he took service under the corporation, found no other investment for his money but its stocks and bonds, thus becoming doubly dependent upon it. The fact that the desperate popular opposition to the consolidation of business in a few powerful hands had no effect to check it proves that there must have been a strong economical reason for it. The small capitalists, with their innumerable petty concerns, had in fact yielded the field to the great aggregations of capital because they belonged to a day of small things and were totally incompetent to the demands of an age of steam and telegraphs and the gigantic scale of its enterprises. To restore the former order of things, even if possible, would have involved returning to the day of stagecoaches. Oppressive and intolerable as was the regime of the great consolidations of capital, even its victims, while they cursed it, were forced to admit the prodigious increase of efficiency which had been imparted to the national industries, the vast economies affected by concentration of management and unity of organization, and to confess that since the new system had taken the place of the old, the wealth of the world had increased at a rate before undreamed of. To be sure, this vast increase had gone chiefly to make the rich richer, increasing the gap between them and the poor. But the fact remained that, as a means merely of producing wealth, capital had been proved efficient in proportion to its consolidation. The restoration of the old system with the subdivision of capital, if it were possible, might indeed bring back a greater equality of conditions, with more individual dignity and freedom, but it would be at the price of general poverty and the arrest of material progress. Was there, then, no way of commanding the services of the mighty wealth-producing principle of consolidated capital without bowing down to a plutocracy like that of Carthage? As soon as men began to ask themselves these questions, they found the answer ready for them. The movement toward the conduct of business by larger and larger aggregations of capital, the tendency toward monopolies, which had been so desperately and vainly resisted, was recognized at last in its true significance as a process which only needed to complete its logical evolution to open a golden future to humanity. Early in the last century, the evolution was completed by the final consolidation of the entire capital of the nation. The industry and commerce of the country, ceasing to be conducted by a set of irresponsible corporations and syndicates of private persons, at their caprice and for their profit, were entrusted to a single syndicate representing the people to be conducted in the common interest for the common profit. The nation, that is to say, organized as the one great business corporation in which all other corporations were absorbed, it became the one capitalist in the place of all other capitalists, the sole employer, the final monopoly in which all previous and lesser monopolies were swallowed up, a monopoly in the profits and economies of which all citizens shared. The epoch of trusts, had ended in the great trust. In a word, the people of the United States concluded to assume the conduct of their own business, just as one hundred odd years before they had assumed the conduct of their own government, organizing now for industrial purposes on precisely the same grounds that they had then organized for political purposes. At last, strangely laid in the world's history, the obvious fact was perceived that no business is so essentially the public business as the industry and commerce on which the people's livelihood depends, and that to entrust it to private persons, to be managed for private profit, is a folly, similar in kind, though vastly greater in magnitude, 
to that of surrendering the functions of political government to kings and nobles to be conducted for their personal glorification. Such a stupendous change as you describe, said I, did not, of course, take place without great bloodshed and terrible convulsions. On the contrary, replied Dr. Leet, there was absolutely no violence. The change had been long foreseen. Public opinion had become fully ripe for it, and the whole mass of the people was behind it. There was no more possibility of opposing it by force than by argument. On the other hand, the popular sentiment toward the great corporations and those identified with them had ceased to be one of bitterness, as they came to realize their necessity as a link, a transition phase, in the evolution of the true industrial system. The most violent foes of the great private monopolies were now forced to recognize how invaluable and indispensable had been their office in educating the people up to the point of assuming control of their own business. Fifty years before, the consolidation of the industries of the country under national control would have seemed a very daring experiment to the most sanguine. But by a series of object lessons seen and studied by all men, the great corporations had taught the people an entirely new set of ideas on this subject. They had seen for many years syndicates handling revenues greater than those of states, and directing the labors of hundreds of thousands of men with an efficiency and economy unattainable in smaller operations. It had come to be recognized as an axiom that the larger the business, the simpler the principles that can be applied to it, that, as the machine is truer than the hand, so the system, which in a great concern does the work of the master's eye in a small business, turns out more accurate results. Thus it came about that, thanks to the corporations themselves, when it was proposed that the nation should assume their functions, the suggestion implied nothing which seemed impracticable even to the timid. To be sure, it was a step beyond any yet taken, a broader generalization, but the very fact that the nation would be the sole corporation in the field would, it was seen, relieve the undertaking of many difficulties with which the partial monopolies had contended. End of chapter 5